My name is Frank Feigenbaum. I'm a neurosurgeon who specifically subspecialized in the treatment of spinal meningeal cysts. I was trained uh, at Georgetown University uh, for medical school. Then I stayed at Georgetown and completed a neurosurgical residency. During that residency, we treated uh, other types of spinal meningeal cysts uh, and it turned out that there wasn't a treatment available for Tarlov cysts. After I graduated from residency I developed a treatment for Tarlov cysts and um, have made that the focus of my practice uh, treating Tarlov cysts and other types of spinal meningeal cysts uh, so that I can give a more complete and um, effective care for patients who have that pathology. Well, there's multiple other types of spinal meningeal cysts. Uh, Tarlov cysts are the most common. Next most common would be something called an intrasacral meningocele, also known as a meningeal diverticulum. The names are synonymous. Unlike Tarlov cysts, which arise from one of the nerve roots, an intrasacral meningocele or meningeal diverticulum arises directly from the spinal sac itself. So, an intrasacral meningocele is kind of an extension of the spinal sac, whereas Tarlov cysts arise from nerves after the nerves have exited the spinal sac. In any case, the intrasacral meningocele, or meningeal diverticulum, takes up a bunch of space in the canal just like Tarlov cysts can, and can also press on the same nerves and cause similar symptoms. There's another type of cyst which is called an ectatic spinal sac cyst. Instead of a cyst that comes off of the spinal sac, which is the intrasacral meningocele, or a Tarlov cyst, which arises from one of the nerve roots that come off the spinal sac, an ectatic spinal sac cyst is a cyst of the spinal sac itself. In other words, the spinal sac doesn't come to a nice tapered end like you see it come to an end here. The end of the spinal sac itself balloons out and takes up a bunch of space in the canal and pushes on the nerves, which can also cause symptoms. Those are the three most common types of spinal meningeal cysts, particularly in the sacral area. The benefit to coming to our practice is that we've treated all the different types of cysts many hundreds of times, and we're able to identify the specific type of cyst and treat it appropriately because each type, and that's very important, because each type of cyst has a different origin and requires a different technique for treatment. Not all Tarlov cysts are symptomatic. In fact, I can do an MRI on 100 people on the street and a lot of them will have Tarlov cysts here or there. It's when the cyst or cysts um, are in a position to compress nerve roots and cause symptoms that they become symptomatic. The typical treatments that patients first pursue are usually non-operative. Uh, they involve um, medications and they're usually through their primary doctor or uh, sometimes patients get sent to a spine doctor or a pain management doctor. And usually the non-operative treatments uh, are treatment with pain modulating drugs uh, like Neurontin, Lyrica, Cymbalta, other drugs like that or other types of uh, pain medications, whether it be anti-inflammatories or narcotic pain medications. Uh, when patients fail that management, then they pursue more uh, invasive treatment. Um, and there's been a lot of things tried uh, in the past. Um, uh, there's been treatments that uh, weren't very successful. Um, I, I consider needle procedures uh, something that I'm against. Some patients have gone and had um, a needle put in their cyst and the fluid aspirated or drawn out. Uh, I, I don't like that. For example, in a Tarlov cyst, a Tarlov cyst is a nerve root and when you put a needle in a cyst, you're putting a needle in a nerve and you can injure the nerve fibers inside that nerve. Um, and in terms of drawing the fluid out, uh, it, it turns out that the fluid inside of a Tarlov cyst is spinal fluid from the spinal sac. The cyst is a nerve that comes off the spinal sac. The spinal sac 
is full of spinal fluid, and the fluid inside a Tarlov cyst comes from the spinal sac. So you can put a needle in a cyst and draw fluid out to your heart's content, but it's just going to keep refilling with spinal fluid from the spinal sac, so that's totally pointless. And after a needle procedure to draw the fluid out, the typical result is, is the cyst just fills back up again. And it exposes patients to a potential for a spinal fluid leak if the hole that the needle put in the cyst doesn't close up. Another thing people have tried is injecting glue into the cyst, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me either. Again, you're putting needles into the cyst, which is a nerve, and then you're filling the cyst up with glue so that it's pushing on things. So I don't like that approach either. I typically treat patients with symptomatic uh, Tarlov cysts with a surgery. Of course, um, only if the patient has failed medical management, uh, for example, with physical therapy and pain clinic and so forth. The, the way that I do the surgery is from the back, on the back of the sacrum, if the cysts are located in the sacral spinal canal, and you expose the cysts, and it turns out, as we said, that each cyst is a nerve, so you can't just remove it because you need those nerves to perform functions. So the surgery, in essence, is to get the fluid out of the cyst so that it's a normal-sized nerve again. As I said, each Tarlov cyst is a spinal nerve root, just overfilled with fluid. So if you get the fluid out of the cyst and make it be a normal-sized nerve again, you can then wrap it with this material like a sleeve. And the sleeve contains the cyst or the nerve and prevents it from filling back up again and pushing on the other nerves around it. The goal of my surgery is to make the cysts be normal sized nerve roots or eliminate the spinal meningeal cyst depending on the cyst type. The goal is to decompress the sacral nerve roots. Those sacral nerve roots have been injured by being compressed which has been manifested by patients having symptoms. I can get the pressure off the nerves. Um, I can't heal the nerves for the patient. So after surgery, it's usually a mixed picture. Uh, some symptoms might get better immediately. Some symptoms might take weeks or months if those nerves were injured more by the cysts and so forth. Patients can get some temporary improvements in symptoms via multiple methods. They can um, modify their behavior. Uh, in other words, if certain activities trigger the symptoms like sitting, maybe they try standing workstation at work or decreasing their activity levels. But unfortunately, this doesn't really change the fact that they have symptomatic spinal meningeal cysts. Also, uh, it's not uncommon for patients uh, to come already having tried multiple pain modulating drugs, Neurontin, Lyrica, Cymbalta, and so forth. Uh, but again, you know, 80% of patients that have a symptomatic spinal meningeal cyst describe that the symptoms are progressive. And um, pain modulating drugs or behavioral modifications typically only work for a short period of time. And if a patient has decreased their activity levels, modified their daily living, in order to compensate, and they have to progressively compensate by doing less and less to keep their symptoms, in other words, sacral pain and so forth, at, a, at, a, at, at one level, then I also call that getting worse because they're limiting their quality of life progressively in order to keep the symptoms stable. anybody can get a symptomatic spinal meningeal cyst. In terms of Tarlov cysts and intrasacral meningocele's and ectatic spinal sac cysts, the most common age at the time of presentation is 50. But I've treated patients um, as young as nine years old and I have patients that are over 80. So really it just depends on if a patient's spinal meningeal cyst is limiting that patient's quality of life to the point where uh, a surgery will benefit them. Well, I, I really feel that um, 
being able to focus my attention on one disease entity has made it possible for me to provide more complete care for patients with that disease. For example, we have a team approach here uh, by multiple uh, physicians and healthcare providers who have lots of experience with these patients, the typical symptoms that they have, their post-operative care, and so forth. And again, focusing my practice on one entity has allowed me to develop a niche and allowed me to better serve the patients with that disease. A good source of information is my website. There's links to chapters that I've written on the topic. You can also call my office and speak to my knowledgeable nurses and staff. Another option is to contact the Tarloff Cyst Disease Foundation in Knoxville, Tennessee, also a great source of information. The ability for me to develop and successfully treat patients with symptomatic Tarloff cysts has been incredibly fulfilling to me because these patients uh, are suffering badly and they can't find help locally where they live and it makes me feel good to be able to help them when they couldn't um, find help elsewhere and we're getting worse. Uh, it just feels great to provide an option for them uh, a path to improvement and recovery.